nice to be with you. My name's Tim Wilson. I'm Executive Director of Maxim Institute, and welcome to our election podcast, Maximize the Election. You're probably thinking, well, what is Maxim Institute? If you don't know us, well, we're a public policy and research uh, think tank, uh, but translation, we help leaders make wise decisions, and uh, we're hoping to help you make some wise decisions electorally with this podcast. I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Marcus Roberts, our Director of Research and Development. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Marcus. Thank you, Tim. Great to be here. And uh, we'll say a big uh, kia ora too to Natasha Bolas, uh, researcher and Australian. Um Yes, it's nice to... No, I'm kidding. Nice to have you, <laughs> Natasha. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually interested in, in hearing your view, Natasha. You've relocated here, um, I'd say, in the last uh, in the last year. And there's, there's a similarity between Australia and a difference. I'm interested in your take because you've experienced, I think, in Australia, versions of what we saw, uh, um, those very, very sad events uh, in Auckland, downtown Auckland, uh, a gunman on the loose, um, innocent uh, innocent people killed, uh, a very, very tragic event. Uh, we'll get to that shortly, but I guess the question here, well, this is a political podcast and we want to talk about the politics of it, what do you think this is really about? And to me, I'll just lead with this. This is, I think this will encapsulate the law and order discussion that has been bubbling away and has been rising up in many senses, uh, there was that Ipsos poll recently where law and order crime was issue number two behind the cost of living crisis. And so what we saw in Auckland recently and that tragedy, I think is going to really, really have an impact on Labour. But through that, Marcus, what do you think, what do you think the real issue is here? What do you think is going to be the takeaway? So, Tim, I, I agree with you that this is bringing to the front and centre law and order again. Um, but it's also bringing to this front and centre something that hasn't been talked about much uh, on the in the political realm, or at least the mainstream, is the um, sentencing, uh, the way in which um, sentencing is done, whether or not sentences being handed down are too lenient, and the uh, whether or not this is due to the government's uh, stated desire to bring down the prison population, which it would it which it has. Um, I think prison numbers are down um, over twenty percent uh, since Labor took 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 office in twenty seventeen. So I think that is certainly uh, you know the the news stories this morning, the day after the event, um, they're all asking questions about well why was this gunman um, not in prison for some pretty mm. serious domestic violence crimes. Yeah, and I can't, it's it's interesting because the responses I've heard from um, the interview with the police minister, Ginny Anderson, was, well, this is about separation of powers. We can't tell the judiciary what to do. And 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 yet there is that, that stated desire to reduce prison numbers. Prison numbers have gone down. Um, I just, I'll, I'll get to you shortly, Natasha, but Marcus, is this, do, do judges listen when governments say we want to reduce prison numbers or what, what's your your apprehension of how this works? So the, the judges shouldn't listen to those sorts of policies, except insofar as they are reflected in the legislation which governs sentencing. Uh, but right. the legislation that governs sentencing is so um, broad and, re and, and leaves a lot of discretion to the judges that- As you would expect. As you would expect to take into account the myriad of, of situations in which judges have to sentence um, uh, prisoners or, or potential prisoners. Um, so that, I think, leaves a lot of discretion to the judges. Officially, the judges, of course, will say nothing. Um, you know, we, we just look at the, the facts. We're not impacted by what the government is saying. Uh, but there is a suspicion that, of course, the government, the judges know what the government wants. Um, and also there's always the thing about who is being appointed judges. Are they people who share a similar outlook mm. on uh, sentencing and criminal justice to the government? That is less less people in a fewer people in prison, um, mm. um, more people on home detention or other other forms of punishment. So there's two. So I think that's the way it, it probably gets in, in influence the judiciary. 
Now, Natasha, you've um, we do have some declining numeracy issues here in New Zealand. You've been uh, looking at the the numbers in terms of around the sentence uh, that the um, that the gunman uh, was handed for home detention. You want to tell us a bit about those, please? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, the numbers are a, a little bit fiddly, but it's two years, three months imprisonment for a violent domestic violence crime. They added nine months to his sentence for the violence of the crime. The fact that he was under supervision at the time, which I believe means he was he had committed another offence prior to that, and the vulnerability of his victim. So that brings us up to three years. Uh, but then they took nine months off because he pled guilty. So that takes you back down to two years, three months. And then a further seven months off for the their cultural background or or his in response to his cultural report that said that, you know, he'd suffered from systemic deprivation and a disconnection from his culture. And the judge felt that that had contributed to his crime. So you're down to one year and eight months for that. But then I I believe his final sentence was five months home detention. So there's some interesting math going on there. Now, my understanding is that this is because judges have the license to, um, if they have um, anything under two years uh, uh, imprisonment, uh, they have the license to implement home detention for that, so that's I think that's that that's why we got to that uh, that predicament. Um, look, in terms of how does this how does this situation compared with the way that you're seeing it discussed uh, and playing out politically, how does this compare to Australia, Natasha? I have to admit I'm not very much across the Australian context uh, in this area, but I, I I guess one of the things I would ask we we talked about the fact that the judiciary don't have a lot of oversight. There's not much that we can do about that. There are there appear to be some policy issues, though, where both national and act differ from Labor, uh, and that would be in the cultural reporting. So that I don't mm. believe cultural reporting is something that Australia has as part of its justice system. I, I could I could be wrong there, but that seems to have been a a big part of the the sentencing decision that was made, uh, mm. and that cultural report I believe is publicly funded. You know the taxpayer pays for that. National oh, and ACT obviously want to to remove that taxpayer funding for that aspect, but that's a policy decision, not a judiciary decision. Interesting, um, interesting commentary on uh, that those cultural reports. Uh, an interview with Floyd Duplessis, who is the president of the Corrections Association. He's talking about the cultural reports, and he says they're not well regulated. They often don't make sense in the sense that um, there's a diversity of people submitting them but there's no coherence uh, mm. so there, there there doesn't uh, there doesn't seem to be um structure into what those reports are what questions those reports are answering the other thing he said was that um that government um have um have essentially decided that they don't want people to go to prison but they haven't put structure or let's see support around anything outside of prison so the system this they're saying okay well we'll turn down the 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 tap of people going into prison but they haven't done anything to mop up the overflow so they've changed the rules but no support so there are not uh, psychological reports for example um and so again this is this is sort of a i guess it's a a sense that okay well we'll change the system but we won't recalibrate the system to attend to the change i want to go um politically on on this now in terms of how this will play out i don't think that this will be good for the current government marcus what do you think yeah i agree tim um there is a, a sense that you get the prime minister um, up the front of the nation, uh, leading us through um, the morning process, looking prime ministerial, um, getting the benefit of incumbency in that respect, in the same way that his predecessor did with many tragedies, um, White Island and, and, and Christchurch um, and, and the start of COVID. Um, but I don't think in this situation that will outweigh the downsides, which are that this feeds into what was already a law and order discussion. This was, you know, law and order week for the government. Uh, and then you have this incident which highlights um, uh, a narrative on of soft on crime by the judiciary and by governmental policies. Um, and also, I think more broadly, a sense of what is going on with this country? The the, mm. the current figures are that the the polling suggests that people by a 
sizable majority don't think the country is on the right track, this would add to it. You're meant to have the first day of the FIFA World Cup a celebration, and instead of the international media reporting on how great New Zealand is as a host nation, the international reports are all on um, a gunman on the loose in central Auckland. And um, just to, to, to FIFAize it a bit, um, New Zealand uh, surprisingly beat Norway, but the Norwegian team were in a hotel 400 metres from the uh, uh, the crime scene. So um, I and my understanding is they were woken by gunshots. Uh, so I don't know how that affected the uh, the, the way that, that they played uh, on um, on at that match. Just to um, just you're right, Marcus, about the that that Labour have sort of decided to get tough on youth crime. That was their going to be their um, their big uh, focus this week. But that that announcement on Tuesday with Calvin Davis, uh, no detail. They're saying, okay, we're going to get tough on youth crime, but no details on on the new facilities, uh, for example, that they were proposing, uh, when they would be built, how much they would cost. No details about what age the kids would end up in the facilities, what model of care would be used, whether there'd be mental health trauma support. It all. I mean, one quote was, it seems to be uh, as if uh, Calvin Davis had drawn it up on. The, on the back of a napkin uh, while flying from Northland to Wellington. Natasha, what's you, been your impression of of crime in New Zealand coming from Australia again? And, and, and don't worry, I will start to treat you as an insider possibly after about five to ten years. That's no problem. Um, I think we had our first experience of crime here in New Zealand shortly after we arrived. Um, our house was broken into than our car. Uh, so it's, it's. I think we've experienced much more crime here than we had back in Australia. I do wonder though, whether, um, you know, cost of living and post COVID having mo- made the change to Australia since some of those factors have started to play out in society, I wonder whether I would find a similar situation if I moved back to Australia. I know that Brisbane, where we were living prior to moving here, they had uh, a home invasion uh, occur in Brisbane shortly after we arrived uh, and Mm. there were fatalities as a result of that. So, I mean, it's hard to kind of compare the two situations and and make a judgment call as yet. Uh, It will be interesting to see how things play out, though, over the long run. Far, far, far too measured for an Australian. Natasha, in terms of, um, we, we, I think I think there's general agreement this is bad for the government. Do you think uh, the opposition, particularly National and ACT, will be able to capitalise on this? I think uh, National has been pushing the tough on crime as a key, mm. uh, a key factor in their campaign from the beginning. So I think this can only help them. I think the only option for Labour really is to make this about gun control, which we know that ACT doesn't support gun control mm. and is actually running on rolling back the registry. Um, but unfortunately for Labour, if they decide to go down the gun control line, I mean, they announced the the gun registry June 2020. It only opened last month. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, dealers of guns don't have to have their weapons registered until 2025. And other people don't have to have theirs registered until 2028. So it's, you know, it, it might be a question of too little too late if they want to to mm. ride on that particular policy. Which has been a consistent theme uh, in terms of, you know, what are the outcomes? What are the deliverables uh, that's been attached to uh, to this government? You look at other measures like child poverty, um climate change, for example, the carbon auctions, et cetera, et cetera. The actual, the things that um, that, the, that the government can go to the electorate and say, look, look here, here's what we did, um, vote us in or out on the basis of that, quite limited. But then again, there's always that, well, we had a pandemic, pandemic to deal with. Marcus, do you see that? I think we're past that uh, explanation though, aren't we? I think so. I think that that will be seen as uh, old news and 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 trying to make excuses. That um, is that really the reason you haven't managed to do um, reform or made things better in, in not just crime but in other areas. I think people are, are going to say, well, that that was a couple of years ago, and were all your ministers doing COVID the entire time? Um, mm. Surely not. Uh, so no, I don't think that that excuse will will wash. Um, it will seem like special pleading. What do you expect over the coming week? Uh, this story will clearly dominate, and I'm looking for some answers. I want to know where the um, uh, where that young man got his gun from. I want to know how he got it. Uh, I want to look also into the sentencing, whether community harm was ever the the sentencing notes that we've seen referred to the impact on the victim uh, and also the trauma of the perpetrator. And and look, I get it in terms of um, 
uh, youth uh, violence callouts. Uh, you know, say we look at the ram raids issue, uh, a huge percentage of the kids who are doing the ram raids, their families uh, are, are family violence um, beacons for police. But I want to know more. I think that's and, and, and it'll be interesting to see what the responses, the stances are of the government uh, as they handle this information and also opposition uh, as they process it and respond. I'm, I, I suspect there will be a focus uh, from the government on gun control as an issue. We'll, we'll be seeing more of that this week. What, uh, what are you seeing, Natasha? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, National and ACT, they're just going to be coming out and, and showing how their particular policies on crime are would have prevented this particular instance. I think things like their three strikes, uh, potentially, I don't know how many uh, charges there were against this young man before he committed this particular crime, but if there were more than three, then, uh, you know, that's that's real evidence for, for National and ACT to say that their their position on this is, is right. Um, but I also think that in terms of details, there may just not be further details. They, you know, that finding out where the gun came from, how he got his hands on the gun, I don't know how useful that will be, and I actually don't know how possible it will be for them to, to find out some of those details. So we might just find that this is what we have to work on and we have to make decisions about how we vote with what mm. we have. So what you're seeing is um, maybe a scarcity of facts, uh, an increasing of rhetoric, and make your decision based on the rhetoric, based on who wins the arguments. Yeah, absolutely. Marcus? Yeah, so I think that this will be dominating the news cycle for the next at least week. Um, Going forward into the campaign, I think it people will lose, uh, you know, new things will occur. We've still got 10 weeks until the election or thereabouts or even more, maybe. Um, and so I think new things will crop up that will take people's attention away from this after a week or so. But I think it will just add to that sense of the country's on the wrong track. Um, the government is soft on crime. There's a problem with crime. Um, so, you know, going into the polling booth in October, people, I don't think, will have this front and centre of their mind, but I think it will add to the sense of, uh, you know, some commentators have talked about a grumpiness around the electorate, and I mm. certainly think that, that that will add to it. And a sense of, and a sense of malaise, a sense of um, floundering. Um, I've got to say, you know, I, um, I felt a very, very... Uh, it was it was a sense of of being placed back in America as the details came out. I spent eleven years in America, reported on um, college shootings like Virginia Tech and the fact oh there's a gunman on the loose, uh, police are locking down the streets. That just felt the the tempo of that felt suddenly like I was back living uh, in the US. Um, when I went to cover Virginia Tech, I um, actually managed to interview one of the victims who had been crouching under a desk in the classroom. Uh, and um, they, the, the the killer actually was going through the classroom and pulled back the desk and looked at him. And I said, "What did you see in his eyes?" And this 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 person who was still quivering from the experience, they said nothing. I just saw a vacuum. That vacuum, that American vacuum, I think has come here and will add to that sense of uh, of floundering and malaise. But look, it's not all about bad news. At Maxim, I want to just very very quickly a generally good egg which is uh, a part of this podcast. It's the positive, hopeful side. Uh, it might be a bit too brief for some people, but um, look, I want to talk about uh, a civil uh, exchange that uh, I was part of recently. I got to MC the Property Investors uh, Association electoral panel, and I was really, really impressed by uh, Dr. Lawrence Junan, who's Green Candidate for Epsom, who showed up into a room of uh, people who would, he's, uh, pardon me, yeah, Green Party, uh, showed up and argued for uh, uh, essentially rent control, for uh, maintaining um, the erosion or the, the taking away of interest, uh, the ability to claim interest uh, that is um, a what the government's doing now, essentially um, making a very anti-landlord platform, but doing it in a way that was civil, and he was civilly received. So um, to the Property Investors Association and to Dr. Uh, Lawrence Junan of the Green Party, my hat is off. Um, anyone else got any uh, generally good egg of the week uh, moments? Yes, uh, I, I saw one, Tim, during the week uh, that the Prime Minister, um, during question time in the House on Wednesday, started off in answering a question to Chris Luxon, the leader of um, National, by wishing him a happy birthday because Luxon had turned 53 that day, um, which was a nice sense of uh, humanity and civility mm. between our politicians. And just a reminder that, you know, um, 
we don't have to agree on things to be civil uh, and wish have common humanity, which is uh, nice. You wouldn't imagine the, the leader of the house, uh, the house majority uh, in uh, in Congress doing that to the <laughs> their their opposite uh, in the Republican Party. So yeah, no, that's a, that's a wonderful moment. Natasha, do you have anything? Oh, mine was actually the same one as Marcus's. I thought it was great. Um, and again, I think a representation of the, the Kiwi spirit, if you will. Mm. Keep it civil. All right, we will continue to keep it civil. Uh, I hope uh, you have learned something um, and, uh, and, and gained something from this discussion. Marcus, Natasha, thank you very much. And thank you for your ears. We'll, uh, we'll be talking to you next week on Maximise the Election. Ka kite. Mm.